Today's case takes place in the UK, specifically Croydon, in the south of London. 18-year-old Sally Ann Bowman was a young woman who had a whole life ahead of her. Born on the 11th of September 1987 in Carshalton, South London, she was the youngest of four daughters to parents Linda and Paul Bowman. Sally Ann was a bright and talented girl who attended the Brit School for Performing Arts and Technology, whose notable alumni included the likes of Amy Winehouse, Adele and Tom Holland. It was therefore no surprise to learn that she was a natural-born entertainer. Sally Ann loved singing and dancing. She had aspirations of featuring on the cover of Vogue magazine and was compared to the likes of Kate Moss. She was a part-time hairdresser and model, modelling for companies such as Swatch Watches, where she would be the face of the company. Clearly, she was on an upward trajectory, although on the 25th of September 2005, her dreams would tragically be taken away from her in cruel fashion. Hello, and welcome to the channel. Saturday the 24th of September 2005 was like any other. After a long week of work, Sally and her older sister, Nicole, were planning a night out on the tiles. They planned to spend the evening at Lloyd's Bar in Croydon, where they arrived at approximately 10pm and stayed drinking until 1am. After leaving the bar, she was taken back to a friend's home via taxi. She was then spotted on CCTV returning to town by taxi. Soon after, she reached out to Lewis Sproston and asked him to pick her up to take her home at Blenheim Crescent, where she was living at the time. Lewis and Sally Ann had been in a relationship which had recently ended. At the time she called Lewis, he too was out with friends. Despite this, Lewis agreed to pick her up and he arrived at 2.20am. However, with the recent breakup still fresh in both of their minds, the couple began to argue shortly after, with both accusing each other of cheating. This argument would last for around one and a half to two hours. Lewis would say that the last time he saw Sally Ann was when she was entering her front garden. He said she was looking at him for a couple of seconds as she made her way to her door. At approximately 4.20 a.m., Neighbours heard screaming coming from outside. However, nobody came outside to investigate, possibly believing it to be the cries of a fox, which was common in that area. Although one neighbour, June Cumper, did look outside her window around five minutes later and saw a man walking towards Sally Ann's home. June, however, didn't have her light on and lost sight of him at Bowman's house. She also said that she heard dragging noises assuming that something was being put into a skip nearby. The horrific reality of the situation would be realised when at 6.30am that morning, Anne Hardy, another neighbour who also heard screams, went outside and saw a pair of legs nearby at a skip. She immediately linked the screams to what she was observing, ruling out the possibility that it was a mannequin, and she would be right. There, she found Sally Ann Bowman, in a pool of her own blood. Police were quickly alerted and arrived to cordon off the area within minutes. Detective Superintendent Stuart Cundy was the lead investigator assigned to the case and was able to identify Sally Ann Bowman after a neighbour confirmed a Polaroid image of her that they had taken. An autopsy was swiftly carried out to determine Sally Ann's final moments. Once this was complete, Detective Superintendent Cundy then went to notify her family. Linda Bowman would receive a knock on her door, whereby she would be greeted by two female officers and Superintendent Cundy. Linda confirmed that she was Sally Ann's mother, but not suspecting the worst, she asked what Sally Ann and Nicole had done wrong, as she knew they were both out the previous night together and assumed they had gotten into trouble. Nothing could have prepared her for the devastating news that they had come to share. He revealed to them that Sally Ann had been brutally stabbed seven times in the neck and abdominal region. 
The attack was so ferocious that three of the seven stab wounds inflicted had exit wounds, indicating that the knife had punctured through her body and out the other side. There were defensive injuries found, suggesting that she put up an incredible struggle, however it wasn't enough. Sickeningly, she had also been sexually assaulted, with it not being ruled out that this took place after Sally Ann passed. There were also multiple bite marks across Sally Ann's body, which contained DNA that the police were able to recover. Lumps of concrete had also been placed in her mouth and genitalia. The killer also took several of Sally Ann's belongings, including her white cardigan, Prada handbag, her passport, mobile phone, and her underwear, likely as trophies. Linda and one of her older sisters had the unimaginable task of identifying Sally Ann's body. Immediately in the police's crosshairs was Sally Ann's ex-boyfriend, Louis Sproston. Not only was Louis the last known person at the time to have seen her alive, but mobile phone records on the night of her murder showed Lewis had threatened spitting on Sally Ann had she been with any other man that evening. The pair were known to argue, but Linda Bowman would say that he was a good man and that Lewis and Sally Ann were, quote, the posh and becks of Surrey, end quote. Nonetheless, the police understandably needed to speak with Lewis and they were able to track him down the same day with two of his friends and his brother. When police approached him, Lewis reportedly asked police if they were there about the row that he had had with Sally Ann the previous night. After admitting this, police immediately arrested him on suspicion of murder. Lewis, along with two of his friends, as well as his brother, would be kept in police custody and interrogated for four days. DNA samples were taken and compared to the DNA found at the crime scene, where police learned that this didn't match. In truth, Lewis wasn't aware at the time of his arrest that Sally Ann had been brutally murdered. It was when he was arrested that he found out. Lewis Broston, his brother and friends were released shortly after the DNA tests came back. In what police initially believed to be an open and shut case had suddenly been blown wide open. Not only was there an unknown killer on the loose, but the DNA taken from Sally Ann's body matched that of an unidentified man who had committed sexual assault four years prior. On the 15th of July 2001, a woman was using a phone box in Purley when she noticed a man approach. The man proceeded to meet the tablet in front of the woman and attempted to enter the phone box unsuccessfully before leaving the shocked woman once he had finished. His semen was found by the phone box door and collected as evidence. It was the same DNA that matched that which was found on Sally Ann four years later. While police had DNA, there was one problem. There was no individual on their database that the DNA was assigned to. What's worse is four days after Sally Ann's murder, another woman would come forward to say that on the same night, about an hour earlier, she had also been attacked. The woman in question told police that while on Sandersted Road, just a 15 minute walk from Blenheim Crescent, after pulling over to use her mobile phone, she was approached by a man holding a knife. Thinking that she was about to be mugged, she held out her handbag, but the man paid no mind to it. Instead, he simply said he was sorry before lunging towards her, beating her over the head with a blunt instrument. The attack may have gone further had it not been for a taxi driver who passed by, scaring off her attacker. The woman hailed the cabbie, who administered first aid and took her to a police station to report what had happened. Another chilling aspect of this crime was that the man stole the woman's phone and her screams could still be heard, indicating that her attacker was still close by. While at the station, she helped police create an e-fit of her attacker and this was distributed across the media. While it was likely that the two events were connected, police were still no closer to identifying Sally Ann's killer. With this new information, police distributed the e-fit to all across major media outlets, but despite the new leads, they still came up short. 
They were relatively confident that the same person who attacked the woman on her phone was also the same person responsible for Sally Ann's murder. Equally, they also thought it probable that whoever this individual was, they lived locally. This was because of the time both crimes were committed, suggesting that the man was familiar with the area. Understandably, the DNA evidence collected was still their most valuable piece of evidence, even though they were unable to positively identify its owner. As a result, their attention turned to finding out whose DNA it was. Based on the description provided to authorities, police wrote to around 4,000 addresses, urging men who matched the general description of the person in the EFIT to submit the DNA. A temporary screening office was set up, with Sally Ann's family in attendance, and it was hoped that approximately 2,500 men would provide a DNA sample. From the 27th of February 2006 to the 12th of March 2006, 771 men visited and gave their DNA, with Detective Stuart Cundy prompting those who received the letter, but didn't attend the test centre, to contact their local police station to arrange an appointment to provide a voluntary sample. While it was highly unlikely that the killer himself would provide his DNA, investigators hoped if a male relative provided a sample, they would be able to establish a familial link and as such find their killer. Not only would this be an extremely long process to compare the DNA of almost 800 people to that which the police already held, but there was a genuine concern that the killer could strike again at any given moment, especially considering that police now had evidence that the attack on Sally Ann wasn't only his first sexual crime, but he had now escalated to murder. It goes without saying that it was imperative that they identified this man soon. They'd release a second EFIT in March, this time provided by the woman who was indecently assaulted in the telephone box in 2001, and they would release the full details of what happened to Sally Ann, hoping it would shock someone that knew who was responsible to come forward. But like before, this yielded no further leads. By June 2006, police were still nowhere near to finding Sally Ann's killer. Fear loomed over the local community, and after nine months since Sally Ann's life was cruelly snatched from her, there was a real worry that the case would go cold. That was until the 15th of June, when a man would be arrested in a completely unconnected event that would turn the whole case on its head. 2006 was a World Cup year, and as one of the biggest global sporting events, millions would tune in to support their respective nation. As England had qualified for the World Cup, there was a natural buzz across the country. If you weren't fortunate enough to get tickets to watch England live, the next best place to watch the Three Lions was the pub. On the 15th of June, England were playing Trinidad and Tobago, and it was here that a man named Mark Dixie would get into a confrontation with another man after this man accidentally knocked over Mark's drink and spilled it onto him. When the unnamed man left, Mark Dixie followed him out and confronted him, shoving him to the ground in front of police. He was arrested immediately and was sent to Crawley Police Station. While there, he had his fingerprints and DNA taken something which by now was standard police procedure when processing individuals. Police didn't know it then, but the arresting officer would say that he found it strange that Dixie was overly upset and tearful, despite the offence he was being arrested for not really being that serious. He would be back on the streets within just a few hours. Meanwhile, police in Crawley had sent off Dixie's DNA for logging into the appropriate databases, 12 days later, his DNA would flag up as a match to both the 2001 incident and the DNA found on Sally Ann Bowman's body. The information was swiftly passed on to the investigation team and all efforts were focused on finding Dixie. They quickly learned that he was working as a chef at Ye Old Six Bells pub in Hawley. Police were cautious of ensuring that the arrest would go smoothly given the access to dangerous weapons Dixie had and the potential that he could take hostages. 
Pub management were pre-warned that arresting officers would be coming to detain Dixie and asked them to ensure that he was out of the kitchen by the time they arrived. However, by a chance of sheer luck, when plainclothed officers arrived, Dixie had stepped outside for a cigarette break. Two arresting officers approached Dixie slowly, making sure they didn't spook him and were able to arrest him without issue. One of the arresting officers, D.I. Chris LePere, stated that as he was carrying out the arrest, he placed his hands on Dixie's chest and could feel his heart beating. Chillingly, he felt no change in rhythm. Dixie had no reaction whatsoever. He would be taken to Sutton Police Station and interrogated. Throughout his entire interview, besides confirming his name, he would only utter two words. No comment. He would be charged that same night with the murder of Sally Ann Bowman. So who was Mark Dixie? As police would come to learn, he wasn't just responsible for the crimes that they had already suspected him of, but he was a man that left a trail of destruction wherever he went. Born on the 24th of September 1970, Mark Dixie was born in Streatham, London. When he was around 18 months old, his parents would separate with his mother remarrying when he was 8 years old. By the time he was 14, Mark Dixie was living in social care. In his adult years, his friends considered him to be the life and soul of the party, but they would also note that he would drink excessively and consume drugs such as cannabis and cocaine frequently. It was also apparent that he would be susceptible to radical mood changes, going from happy-go-lucky to quiet and angry very quickly. At the time of his arrest, Dixie had three children, all of whom were boys. What many didn't know about Dixie was his extensive rap sheet. His crimes stretched back as far as 1986, where he was sentenced to six weeks detention after mugging a woman at Knife Point in Stockwell. He then moved to Sidcup in 1987, where he was convicted of burglary and robbery. The following year, he would be sentenced to two years probation after being convicted of indecent assault and indecent exposure. Later that same year, he was convicted of indecent assault and assault occasioning actual bodily harm. For this, he would receive a six-month prison sentence. Then in 1989, just a year later, he was again convicted of indecent exposure and was sentenced to 80 hours community service. He was then convicted of assaulting a police officer in 1990. In 1993, Dixie moved to Australia and would spend six years there. He would overstay his visa returning in 1999 after being convicted of a sex offence where he would be fined and deported back to England. Then there was the 2001 incident in the telephone box that his DNA matched to as well as the attack moments before Sally Ann Bowman was murdered on the 25th of September 2005. However to date he was not charged for either offence. Police learned that on the night of the murder Mark was celebrating his birthday and at around 7pm he had arrived at the Windsor Castle pub on Brighton Road Croydon with two friends to meet up with others who had also arranged to be there to celebrate. During the evening he had two lines of coke and drank heavily. Those present who saw Mark said that he wasn't acting out of character that evening although when he found out that Stacy Nivett, Dixie's ex-partner who had split from him on the 1st of September was not going to be attending Mark's party. The other guests noted that after his telephone conversation with her, his mood had instantly changed. He was quiet and began drinking more excessively. After last orders, Dixie returned to the home of one of his friends, Victoria Chandler, and another woman to continue the party at her Avondale Road residence. Avondale Road was just two streets from Blenheim Crescent, at around 2.30am, Victoria and their friend called it a night and left Mark alone on the sofa. The next part is what police believed happened. 
as to this date Mark has not revealed exactly what happened. It's believed that around 3am, Mark Dixie left the property, taking a knife with him. Whether this was a knife belonging to Victoria, or a chef's knife that Mark himself owned, it's not known, as the murder weapon was never recovered. Nonetheless, he went out roaming for a potential victim, before stumbling upon the woman making her phone call. After this attack had been interrupted, investigators believed that this left Dixie incredibly frustrated. He then made the short journey from Sandersted Road to Blenheim Crescent, where he had actually lived for a short time in 2003. There he saw Sally Ann Bowman and Lewis Sproston arguing in his car. He would lay and wait until Sally Ann got out the car and Lewis had left, before launching his attack on Sally Ann. After stabbing her, he hid nearby, knowing that he may have potentially disturbed neighbours. But when no one came, he washed himself using a nearby tap in his old front garden, before walking back over to Sally Ann's potentially lifeless body and sexually assaulting her. Afterwards, he returned back to Victoria's home and fell asleep on the sofa. When the women saw him the next morning, there was no indication from Mark that he had snuck out while they both slept. Convinced that the crimes they already knew about were not the only ones, police would send Mark Dixie's DNA to Western Australia in October 2006. Between 1996 and 97, Dixie was believed to be living in the Claremont area around the same time as the Claremont serial killings and was touted as a possible suspect. Evidently this turned out not to be the case, as Bradley Robert Edwards would eventually be convicted on two out of three counts on the 24th of September 2020. However, his DNA would match another crime scene. In 1998, an unnamed Thai woman was house-sitting for a friend when she heard noises coming from another room. As she went to investigate, she was shocked to see a man had broken into the property, wearing tights over his head. He demanded cash, but when she told him she had none to give, he instead demanded she remove her top. Moments later, he had stabbed her multiple times. She lost consciousness and was sexually assaulted, after which her attacker fled, taking some of her personal belongings as trophies. Miraculously, she survived her ordeal and was able to contact emergency services. DNA was recovered from her underwear. That DNA was Mark Dixie's. His trial would begin on the 4th of February 2008 at the Old Bailey, where he would plead not guilty to murdering Sally Ann Bowman. He would admit to going out after his friends went to bed, but he did this, according to him, to score more drugs. He claimed to have come across Sally Ann Bowman on the floor. He then said he sexually assaulted Sally Ann, believing her to be unconscious at the time. He also claimed to have not noticed any blood at the time. In addition, he claimed to have only realised that Sally Ann was dead when he bit her and found she was unresponsive. Of course, this was utterly ridiculous and a jury would also find this story ludicrous. On the 22nd of February 2008, Mark Dixie was found guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment, with a minimum term set at 34 years. The earliest that he could possibly be released would be 2040. He would be 70 by this point. The story doesn't just end there. In August of 2003, a man by the name of Romano van der Dussen had been sentenced to 15 years in prison after a string of violent sexual assaults that had taken place in Fuengirola, Spain. In 2007, Mark Dixie's DNA was sent for analysis there, as he was also in the area at the time of the attacks. It transpired in at least one of the attacks. DNA had been gathered, DNA which matched Dixie's. However, Mark Dixie would wait until June 2015 before confessing to the sexual assaults, resulting in Romano van der Dussen being exonerated and released in February 2016, 
12 years after his wrongful conviction. During his time there, he was regularly beaten, spat on, and in his words, treated like a cockroach. Mark Dixie would also confess to another two unsolved sexual assaults and was handed a further two life sentences in 2017, with Romano van der Dussen watching in attendance. In the years after his conviction, Mark Dixie would deny having anything to do with Sally Ann Bowman's murder, but in 2015 he would finally confess. However, to this date, Sally Ann's belongings have never been recovered, despite multiple pleas from Linda Bowman, who had even resorted to writing to Dixie directly, asking for the location of her daughter's possessions. In the years since her death, the resting site of Sally Ann Bowman had been vandalised on multiple occasions. This resulted in her family exhuming her ashes in 2013 and moving them to an undisclosed location back at home. While the Bowman family praised the police for their work solving Sally Ann's murder, they began campaigning for a national database to be set up to collect DNA of every UK citizen, in the hopes that future criminals would be caught much, much sooner than the nine months that they themselves had to wait. This idea would be rejected in Parliament, after citing practical and civil liberty issues with having such a database in place. The unimaginable pain and devastation that man has left on so many people's lives is unfathomable. While I was somewhat familiar with this case, given the intense media attention at the time, I was completely unaware at how far Mark Dixie's evilness had spread. Dixie is nothing more than a cold, remorseless specimen, incapable of feeling compassion for others and only concerning himself with his own self-preservation. Life behind bars is too good for a man like him. While I agree that police efforts to catch Mark Dixie for this horrendous crime was commendable, there are criticisms to make for the times that he either got away with crimes, or in cases where he received a less than desired punishment for crimes that he had committed. There were opportunities, such as the wrongful conviction of Romano van der Dussen, or the relaxed punishments he received while living in Australia which could have resulted in Sally Ann still being with her family to this day, living out her true potential. But unfortunately, this cannot be changed. Thank you for watching. If you found this case informative, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell so you never miss an upload. I also want to give a shout out to my channel members, The Alabastard, Needle and Fur, and Amanda. I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.